to the degree that you want something is the degree you're afraid of not having. Yeah. God, I wish I started when I was younger. I go, well, yeah, but you didn't. So shut the fuck up and let's <laughs> right. keep going. Right. Like, you can't, <laughs> Nobody changes until they change their energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. Because it's not till then that it's really real. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is way worse than I thought. It's like, oh yeah, it's way, way worse than you thought. Yeah. But luckily there's more to you than you think. Eric, what's happening, man? What it do? How's it going? It's really good, man. Good. So I brought you in here because I recorded a podcast with business legend Seth Godin, and I recorded it uh, digitally, which is something I normally don't do, and my audio quality is pretty awful, but he has some real gems of wisdom. And since we've been working with a lot of entrepreneurs through our Fit for Service and through all the programs that we're doing, Coming out with, I thought, why don't we just sit down here and listen to some of his gems and then riff on those and uh, and talk to everybody about them. Sounds good. I'll say yes to every opportunity. <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. So we're going to play these clips for you guys, and um, you're going to listen to Seth talk, and then you'll listen to the response from Eric and I, and uh, we'll just make our way through this thing. And again, apologize for the uh, quality of the sound. We did our best. Um, but I think, uh, I think it's going to come out. All right. Me too. All right, let's go. Well, I think it's worth starting with a distinction between freelancing and entrepreneurship and <clears throat> entrepreneurship is a special thing. Entrepreneurship is, uh, building an entity bigger than yourself where you make money when you sleep and where you don't do any of the jobs that your job as an entrepreneur is to hire people to do every job so that you only have the job of hiring people to do every job. Freelancing, on the other hand, which is something I get to do every day, is using your own two fingers, using your own spirit to make something that only you could have made. And freelancing is a job without a boss. And freelancing can only scale by betting, by getting better clients. It doesn't scale by spending more time because you'll run out of time. And what that means is that we are creating this economy where some people who have a job without a boss have hired the worst possible boss themselves to do the, the worst work for the worst clients, right? This is the person uh, who's working for $3 an hour on Fiverr or, or whatever doing uh, grunt work. But you can move your way up. And the way you move your way up is by standing for something and by serving people in a way that only you can do it. So there are coaches who make $20 an hour and there are coaches who make $2,000 an hour and both coaches are doing similar work, but they might be doing them for different people or they might be in the business of connecting others because if you can connect people, then you are doing something that starts to feel more like entrepreneurship. You're not on stage at every moment. So I'm, I'm excited about this growth of called the gig economy if you want, but really disappointed that so many people are getting trapped working to make a social network happy or working to make a, a mesh company happy when they'd be better off finding the 20 clients, that's all they need, and choosing wisely as opposed to just racing around looking for likes and followers. All right, so he has quite a bit in that clip. And I think the first thing is he's drawing a distinction between an entrepreneur and a freelancer, which is the word that he uses. And I think that's really interesting to just realize that there's a lot of freelancers and it's a name that we've decided to change to entrepreneur, someone who is like an independent entrepreneur, because a lot of freelancers are calling themselves entrepreneurs because they like that name better. And freelancer yeah. sounds transient and sounds like, doesn't sound as sexy. <laughs> so I think that's why people are calling themselves entrepreneurs, but they're really not. They're really just offering their own services and skills. Yeah, and I think to set the stage, like the reason this is so interesting and why we want to talk about it is there are so many other options for how to be in the world and a way to make money. And it's not just going somewhere and exchanging your time for the nine to five. <clears throat> and the only story that most people have been given outside of the ordinary world, which is the nine to five, 
is the entrepreneur story. And we're really excited to talk about this freelancing slash entrepreneur story. Yeah. I mean, and when he talks about, you know, the gig economy exploding, when you're looking at some of those numbers, um, you know, we were doing some research and it was showing that that freelancing gig slash entrepreneur economy is at like a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars. Like just let that kind of soak in like there's room, you know? And so we have all of these different pressures from society, from our parents, all these different things that tell us that we have to go one way or another. And entrepreneur is now kind of one of those challenging but established ways that you can do it it's like being like a restaurateur like you open up a restaurant and people are like uh oh i don't know if that shit's gonna work <laughs> you know but nonetheless like it's like well maybe it will you know because we've seen it happen and same with entrepreneur but i think there's a not a lot of people that really trust that you couldn't be a coach or provide your service or as seth was saying you know standing for something and serving people in only the way that you can right which I think is really what, you know, the ultimate fruition of this is all about. Yeah, and my dramatic spiritual part of me truly believes that everybody has a thing that they are a teacher at if they truly pursued their passion in and that everybody at their core has an entrepreneur spirit. Some people's entrepreneur spirit is to be an entrepreneur, but I think most people have a thing that they would want to be teaching if they were courageous enough. And one of the things that we've used to help people find this aspect, and we're going to have a whole different freemium where we're going to talk about all of the strategies that we use to bring people through this whole program. But one of the things that we talk about in that is what Robert Greene calls the Da Vinci effect. Right. And so he got that name because Da Vinci was great with anatomy, great with engineering, great with drawing, great with painting, great with sculpting, great with thinking, great with philosophy, great with everything. And all of a sudden he's creating these magnificent pieces of art and, and pieces of science and different works because he was able to combine his mastery of so many different things. Right. And I think that's something that when you find that entrepreneur who's actually harnessing and serving their medicine in the way that only they can, offering something to people that only they can, it's usually because they're drawing on multiple different disciplines. Right. And different areas where they've become masters at. Yeah, like the fundamental truth is that no being in recorded history in the past or in the future will have your combination of genes and your combination of experiences and there's something that only you can give the world. And if you find the disparate parts of your experiences and your skill set and you bring them together there's a unique thing that only you can do that you are the best in the world at and that's that thing that i think is going to fill us with the most enthusiasm right. fill us with the most passion get us fired up to get out of bed every morning and and serve that because it's if we don't nobody else is and i right. think that's something that seth's going to talk about you know a little bit more as we go on so we might as well do that the last thing i wanted to touch on is Really, he's saying here is like, all you need is 20 clients. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's that thousand true fans idea, which I think is a good idea. And he'll get into, yeah. And he talks about that as well. Um, but really, in this clip, what he's saying is 20 clients. 20. And then you have a lifestyle where you're actually doing exactly what you want to do, doing the thing that only you can do, and you're sustaining yourself. 20 people, bro. Yeah. Wow. It's very I mean, attainable. It's very attainable, very possible. And whether that starts as like a side hustle, as Gary Vee would say, or whether you go straight into it, you know, it just shows you like with the trillion dollar industry and with Seth saying something like, you just really need 20 clients, which is accurate, then it really just starts to become possible. Yep. And I think that's what people need. People need to have that, just a little bit of that hope and belief like, wow, this is real. And this is possible and I could fucking do it. And it's never been more attainable than now because of the rise of social media and the rise of the internet. Truth. All right, let's hear the next clip. The first thing is the hardest part about coaching isn't coaching. The hardest part, part of coaching is getting coaching clients. There's only two kinds of people, people who already have a coach, in which case you have to get them to quit their coach and pick you, or people who don't have a coach, in which case you have to persuade them that they need a coach. And neither one of these things is easy. It's not like selling an ice cream cone where people make a new decision every day. With that said, there are really only a dozen 
basic human drivers, maybe fewer than that. Things that deep down people actually want. And most of us are immune to buying something that shows up and directly promises us one of those things. So you'll see a, a, a full page ad for a purse or a, a cosmetics from Chanel or whatever, some luxury good. And what the ad does not say is uh, showing up to people at your high school reunion will make you feel good. You should buy this. That they're much more indirect than that. And that we seek the gym not because a physique all by itself on a desert island would help us in any way, but because it makes us feel good to look good in front of certain people in a certain time. And we just don't say that when we're selling the thing we are selling. And that's part of what it means to tell a story. That when we tell a five-year-old a good night story, and we're talking about once upon a time and elves and dragons and things, what we're really saying is, you're safe and you can hear your dad's voice. But if that's all dad said, it wouldn't work. That you have to actually go through the act of telling the story. So what we get to do as marketers is tell stories that resonate with people in a language that they're used to hearing. And it may be that talking to people about something that their peers have persuaded them is important is the best way to get them onto the therapist's couch, get them to be working with a coach or in a gym. But then the great work happens when we get past the tactic and can get at the heart of what it means to be a human. That's when we're actually able to make change happen. You know, in the, in the, in the workshops I'm running, the average person gives and gets 500 pieces of feedback a month. And I know that people are signing up because they think they're going to get videos from me. But every single person we engage with tells us after the workshop that the videos from me were the least important part. And that what really mattered was the way it made them feel to be surrounded by others on a similar journey. So again, I mean, he just packs it in. Yeah. You know, I mean, that was the beautiful part of this podcast is just like, you know, he would just go on a roll. Gems. And it would just be gems pouring out, <laughs> pouring out of his mouth. I mean really interesting thing talking about coaching because coaching is a huge part of this entrepreneur kind of economy that's right. coming up it's what people are offering because if you're one step ahead of somebody else then you're able to actually teach them how to get from where they are to where you are you don't always have to be the full ascended master to start teaching spirituality actually you might be too far away you yeah. know like if buddha came down <laughs> to like some you, you hear stories of some of like the the really strict buddhists you know, and they'll be like, the Buddha way is the sound of the cricket. And they'll say some like abstract shit like that. And you're like, what the fuck you mean? I, I don't know. I don't know how to be what? Like, I need more clues, man. Like, yeah. how do I get from here to there? Like, I'm yeah. just fucking I'm pissed off in the mornings. Yeah. And I'm like, I get road rage. And I'm like, don't tell me it's the About sound crickets. of the cricket. You know, like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> You know, so that's somebody who's so far away that it's right. like difficult to even relate to where they're at now. And and to be a coach, you just have to be far far enough beyond those people that you're coaching that you can actually help them move along the path. One step in the direction that they want to go. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I hear in that clip that really resonate is there are only a core set of human drives that we truly care about. But we don't respond if what you're offering is a direct change to one of those drives. We respond to stories. And what stories inherently offer is some new way of being. It, it invites a change. And if you're not providing a product, you're providing a service. And the service is always to create some type of change in the person paying for the service. And the core about how to begin to do that dance is to learn how to tell stories. And you know the best story that you can tell is the story of yourself being the reality. Yep. You know, and that's the that's the ultimate truth. Like I was telling my family stories about doing psychedelics, trying to get them to do it, and they're like, "Not, nah, not, nah, not." Nah. And then one day I just came home from doing Wachuma, and I was just glowing, and I was so happy, you know. And I was just like, "They're like, you want a drink?" And I was like, "Nope, I'm good." And I'm just playing with the kids and and just beaming you know from that kind of state of 
existence that can happen at the tail end of a transformational experience like yeah. the Watch Human Journeys with Don Howard. And they just looked at me and they're like, hey, I think we want to go yeah. and go go to the place that you went to. And I was like, what? Really? Cool. I've been trying to convince you guys for years. Yeah, I would sit down with them at the dinner table and yeah. talk to them about it and describe it and talk to them about it for hours. And they'd be like, yeah, nope, not not doing that. Yeah, but then is... I just showed up and I was being, and the story was told not with words. The story was told with my essence. Yeah, and I think that this is something that we'll talk about further into the podcast, but it's why it's so powerful if you leverage social media as the place where you authentically share your transformations. Because if you truly share each step that you're taking, you're showing by example what it is that people will eventually want from you as a service. And so we're going to talk about this in the guide that we're going to offer, and there'll be links to that at the end of the podcast. But you know, people have a strange relationship with money because they've seen the things that money has been used, you know, the ill-gotten gains, yeah. same with power. And there's all these ideas about money and power that they're bad because the associations that people have seen are bad. People have a little bit of that with social media too. For sure they do. You know, people think like, ooh, social media, ooh, you're trapped on it, ooh, your, your phone is controlling you, ooh, you're sharing only the good parts, ooh, you're sh putting filters on and blah, blah, blah. Social media is just a tool. I think that's one of the things that Gary Vee like really hammers home. Like, get the fuck out of here. This yeah. is a tool. This tool is neutral. It's how you use it that matters. And I think that's something that's really important because I think people use a lot of these excuses about oh, it's social media, you know, to pretend like that's not a viable channel to share their authentic essence of being. Yeah. Which it is a viable channel to do that if you choose to fucking do that. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to show something that's fake and, you know, exaggerated and not real, you can do that too. You can do that in regular life too. Guess what? You know what I mean? Like, it's just a tool. And I think it's really important for people to recognize that, to use the tools that we have available and you can use them however you want. Yeah, and I think the thing to really hone in on is recognize the power of the tool and the work that you have to do to use the tool correctly. You know, like we don't give an eight-year-old a fucking blade you know you don't give a, a i mean i had one when i was of course you did <laughs> I, was, I was swinging full swords <laughs> at seven but it's it's a thing to recognize that it's a very powerful tool right. money power social media but you're also responsible for becoming fit to wield it and if you become fit to wield it you can help people like someone who knows how to use a sword can protect the people that they love someone who learns how to use money or power or social media can make the world a better place that's truth. Moving on. What does it mean to sell somebody something or to market something? Because <clears throat> it's super easy to pay attention to the loudest people who are the hustlers, who are the people who are short cutters, and imagine that selling or marketing is something we do to people, but it doesn't have to feel that way. If you were a lifeguard and someone was drowning, you would just jump in and save them. And it's quite likely you weren't doing it for yourself. You were doing it for them. And if we talk to the person afterwards, they would be glad that you did this. Well, there are so many variations of this, of how we get to be generous by bringing empathy to the table to do it for and with other people as opposed to at them or to them. And... So our job is to show up with something that's going to make things better. Not for everyone, but when we find someone that's for, to be able to help them leap into where they want to go. What is your opinion of, of as it concerns the ethics of marketing? What is your opinion of, let's say you have a product or service that you genuinely believe, if not borderline no, obviously we can't know anything, but believe with the utmost epistemological certainty that it is going to be beneficial to a particular individual or type of individual. However, that individual is resistant to accepting or adopting that product or service. Do what is your what is your idea about using psychological in some ways manipulation in order to get them what you believe will help them? So the ends, the, do the ends justify the means or do you kind of draw a hard line where you say, 
the means must align with the ends and it all must, you know, have a certain air of just radical honesty and impeccability. And if people don't choose it, they don't choose it. Well, I might be defining manipulation a little differently. For me, <clears throat> manipulation means if they knew what you knew, once they discover what you know, will they be disappointed in what you did? So a car used car salesperson knows how to manipulate someone into buying a car that they will regret later. I feel like that's fundamentally different than a cardiologist working all the angles to get someone to quit smoking. Because <clears throat> people who have been manipulated into quitting smoking do not feel like they were manipulated. They are glad <clears throat> they are glad they quit smoking. So for me, you know, very few of us see a thing sitting on the corner and then buy it. That it's been a very long time since it was sufficient to just say, here it is. It's, you know, it's a piece of cold fish on some rice. Do you want some? And someone buys it. That it is way more likely that we are telling a story, that we are touching uh, deeply into what they believe, what they want, where they're going, who they are. And most of all, who their peers are and who they want their peers to be. And when we do those things on behalf of someone else, then they're not being manipulated because when they're done, they're glad that they did it. And so I draw a very bright line between people who are doing something that they would never do if they weren't getting paid for it, that they would never do if there wasn't an upside for them, and people who are bringing something to others and who would, they would be happy to do it even if it wasn't their job. And a great example, mm -hmm. if, if we look at how this idea has spread, is Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, the thing about them is they're anonymous. We don't even know where their headquarters are or who's in charge. We don't, I don't think they have an ad budget. Maybe they do. But the point is Alcoholics Anonymous is a brilliant marketing effort. It has changed the lives of millions and millions of people 100% peer-to-peer, people engaging with others, not at them, but with them. And so if, if you can change lives that deeply at that scale for free, just imagine what you could do if you're in it to build a business. Covers a lot there, too. <laughs> um, he starts off with that lifeguard story, and I think this is a story that you really resonate with because I've heard you talk about it quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the most tragic things that I've seen in the last maybe five or six years is dozens and dozens and dozens of quote-unquote spiritual people who have something beautiful to offer the world who will not do it because of their shitty stories about money. And they really have a skill that if they gave to the people around them, it would be akin to a lifeguard saving someone from drowning. And to not do that because you won't look at your stories about money or that you believe that to sell something or to market something is inherently bad, you are not serving your medicine to the world. And I know so many people who are my close friends who are in poverty because of their stories about money. And if they could just listen to this podcast and connect to the fact that they are actually helping people and that it's not bad to get money, it would change their life and it would reduce the suffering that I at least see them going through and that I go through watching them. I mean, and that's one aspect, people who have resistance to, to sharing their story in a way that they would charge for it. But man, there's so many people who have resistance to just sharing their story, period. Yeah, it was the main thing in our workshop. You know, we when we were, yeah, we were going through that workshop in Tulum for Fit for Service, like so many people were just so hesitant to share their story. And everybody has something that they can share. Maybe they recovered from an addiction. Maybe they have dealt with heartbreak in a certain way. Like all of these human things, they're all human things. They're all things that are like part of being a human being. And if you have the courage to share that, it's going to help somebody. You know, it's like I can't tell you how many times I post something that's personal and vulnerable and I'll have... 10, 20 people be like, oh my God, this was exactly the thing I needed to hear right now, you know? And so, yeah, all right, you can say like, I have a scale that's a little bit larger than most, but it doesn't matter. You're going to have people with however many followers or however many that, that are going to feel the same way and that's going to grow. 
they're going to be like, wow, I really needed to hear that. Yeah. Like I know people that have 200 followers who share some very personal and real thing on their Instagram. And then a couple of people from high school <clears throat> DMs them and they had no idea that these people were paying attention to them for the last 10 years. And they said like, what you said is exactly what I needed to hear. I've been going through a really hard time. Thank you so much. I, I, I really appreciate what you're doing. Like we have no idea who's watching. And the more honest and the more vulnerable that you can be about your transformations, like it is helping and you can't know to the magnitude and to the breadth that it's reaching. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting that, you know, you, you just don't know what your acts of kindness and what your acts of courage, like what the effect might be. I mean, the, the idea that comes to mind is the movie Joker, right? Mm. You know, like, yeah. What would be the effect of one really kind, open-hearted person who took that guy in and made him like a close friend and was there for him and yeah. loved him? And like, what would be the effect of that? You know, and like, you just don't know. Or it just, even if it was something smaller, maybe that seems like actually like a large commitment. But maybe it was smaller. Maybe right at one of those moments, it would be just enough to get him to the next spot where somebody else could, have, could yeah. be kind or... You don't know. And social media is an opportunity to do that with so many different people where just one, that one positive thing, that one one dose of you know truth and medicine and kindness and compassion given out to the world with the courage to know that there's going to be some people who maybe talk shit and there's going to be some other people. You know, that's that's a huge thing. Yeah. I was watching a horror movie with some friends and uh, one of my friends does not like horror movies. And by the time that we got to the end, the only thing he said, and I thought it was really poignant and I thought about it for a while. And what he said was, if anyone in that movie had made one act in love, it wouldn't have happened. And then it got me thinking about like Greek tragedies. Like if the character just took one moment to like have a moment of truth, where they just stopped hiding, stopped lying, stopped avoiding, and just had one moment of real love, which is truth. It would short circuit the whole tragedy. Mm. It would short circuit the entire horror movie. Like it can only get to the real nasty parts step by step by not being in truth, not being in love. And that sharing your truth is like, you have no idea the effect that it can have. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought about that when I watched the you know, the final episodes of Game of Thrones, right? Like any, there were so many characters and if any one of them would have shown Khaleesi like genuine love, she may not have, you know, had that final ride on Drogo and burned the whole city down and been, you know, so consumed with the lust for power because she would have had love as a viable option. But in the denial of love as a viable option, well, you choose power, that sweet, sticky surrogate, you know, that makes you feel important, but it doesn't fill you like love does, but it's a nice alternative, nice quotes, you know, it's an alternative yeah. that you can actually seek. And that's why those are those two disparate, you know, choices that you can make love or power. But and this is a deeper point, but I think the way to dance with power or money or social media properly is you have to have the self love. Because mm -hmm. if you think, I think the reason why we have all these stories about these things corrupting is that if you try to use that tool to fill the void inside of you, it's just going to be bad for everybody involved. And no the, doubt. the way to use the weapon is to have the self love. No doubt. There's also another story that comes to mind, you know, referring to the lifeguard thing. A lot of people may feel like, I don't even care. Like, I don't want to help people. Like, it doesn't matter. And Ramdas tells a story about he met up with a, with a person who was like, Yeah, I don't care about helping people. I'm never going to help anybody. I don't want to help anybody. And obviously this man had been betrayed by a lot of people and he had his own trauma about it. And Ramdas was like, oh, curious. This guy says he's never going to help anybody. So he's like, okay, let's go for a walk. And they're going through a walk down the streets of New York. And Ramdas identifies a place where he's going to actually trip himself and, and trip himself so significantly that he's going to really fall down unless the other guy helps him. So he had to like fully commit. He's like, I can't fake a trip. I got to really trip myself. Yeah. So they're walking side by side and Ramdas trips and he's going to fall and eat shit on the concrete. And the guy then, of course, as he sees Ramdas falling and I'm about to crash into the ground, grabs him and helps him and lifts him back up. <laughs> and Ramdas smiles at him and says, I thought you're never going to help anybody. And the guy's like, 
shit. <laughs> you know, like you got me. That's beautiful. Like yeah. in those moments, the, that unconscious thought, you know, that is going to be to help somebody. And like we can, our our mind may say like, no, nah, I don't care. From wounds and trauma. From wounds and trauma. But but what we're really drawn to is like, we see somebody falling, we're going to help. Yep. You know, like the hero is like underneath the surface. And as soon as we we short circuit that kind of mental fog that we're in and we allow that part to come out, it's going to come out. And we're going to want to help people. So we just got to recognize that underneath, even the even that apathy, even that, you know, kind of disconnection, there's probably a part of you that really wants to help people and really would at any given moment. And I think in hindsight, what this podcast with Seth Godin is, is stories to help you remove the fog. Yeah. To see what's actually already there. And it's that you want to be of service, period. Yeah. We got to talk about the second part of this. Um which is in which I was asking him the question about, you know, whether if you know something's good for somebody, is it okay to use techniques or tactics to help get them to do it? Right. And I think he had a really elegant way of describing this, um, being that basically if they knew what you knew, you know, would they want to do it? Would they be disappointed in having? Would they be it? disappointed, or would they, or, or would they be like, "Oh yeah, that was the right choice." Yeah, and so it kind of gives you some latitude um, within reason to be like, "Look, if you really knew what I knew, you would do this." But you're not going to trust me if I just tell you. Right. I'm going to need to tell you a story. Exactly. And like, because that's the way that the mind works. I'll tell you a story, and the story is not a false story. It's just a story. It's just wrapping the truth. Mm -hmm. into a story you know and then if i wrap the truth into the story then you're going to accept that story and then you're actually going to get the outcome that you're interested in yeah i think it comes down to it's on us as the people providing the threshold to make it look as sexy as possible within truth like make the door mahogany wood put lights around it and they ultimately have to choose to walk through but if we truly in our core believe that them walking through that is going to make their life better, we're responsible for making that doorway as beautiful and enchanting as it can possibly be. But we also have to have done the work to truly believe that that threshold is the right threshold. And right. Seth will get into the feeling of imposter syndrome, but right, yeah, I mean, because the there's so many other so many other situations that you see where people are just creating shiny you know, shiny illusions to draw people through and pick their pockets. Right. You know, and if people knew what they knew, you know, we're selling this shitty product or we have this shitty service. And when you're done with this, right. you know, like you're not going to be happy. Well, like that's been something that we're kind of accustomed to. So everybody's kind of looking with a skeptical eye yeah. as they should, you know, but nonetheless, that shouldn't deter those who are offering something that's of like genuine value. Yeah, and then yeah. that's also why, like, serve your service in your own name, you know, because we live in the time of social media that if if your threshold is a trick, you won't last. Right. You will not last. You will be exposed. And so the people who are doing service under their own name, like, they're invested in doing a great job and having whatever it is that they serve be authentic because it's attached to their name. And we live in a time where you can't run now. Like a sociopath could go from village to village to village robbing people. Any charlatan could. That time is over. Yeah, it's done. That will follow you forever. Like, you know, people will, people will make comments about the fit for service program, right? From the outside, having not been in it. And if actually people weren't really fucking digging fit for service, you think the world wouldn't know? <laughs> right. You think like we're going to be able to keep this shit a secret? Right. You know what I mean? Like, fuck no. Every single one of them. We use Instagram as our communications platform. You know what I mean? Like, obviously we have to deliver the goods. Right. And if we don't, you're going to fucking hear about it for sure. Yep. You know what I mean? That's just the way, that's just the way it's going to go. You know, and that's why like, you know, when we did that poll, and this isn't just to promote this program, but we do a poll at the end, and we're like, would you recommend this to friends and family? 96% say yes. Yep. If that number was 50%, we'd be in fucking in trouble. I'd particularly be in trouble. People would be like, this is some whack-ass fucking program. That works and it would for like, be public. It would be public, and it'd be out there, and people would know. And it's not like, you know, 
having a public failure is the end of your life you have to acknowledge it say like look i thought this was going to work it did not work it was shit maybe you deliver a faulty product maybe it's a beta version you got to recall it you're like yep. this thing keeps breaking i thought it was good but it's not and it keeps breaking as long as you just attack that with truth or let's say any program or something i did didn't work or it sucked I'd have to just come out and say, like, yo, hey, everybody, so sorry about this. This thing sucked. Here's all your money back, like, right. blah, blah, blah. You just address it and move on. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try. Absolutely. Like, don't let that fear of failure, like, prevent you from trying. You just know that you can do that, but you have to treat that with honesty. Yeah. And you have to, as you're pushing it out, know that, look, I really believe in this thing. And yeah, he's going to talk about that more about this idea that if you feel 100% confident in what you're doing, you're either playing too small or you're a sociopath. Well, let's roll the tape. In the marketing seminar that we run, this is one of the core tenets. So imagine that uh, there's a stand up comedian trying to make a comeback, and uh, his agent gets him a, a gig. Great gig, he says. 400 people, New York City. So the comic goes there, he brings his best material and he's up there and he's just hitting all his marks and no one is laughing. And for half an hour, he's doing everything he knows how to do and no one is laughing. And at the end of the show, the agent comes up to him sheepishly and says, well, I made a mistake. It was an Italian tour group and no one here speaks English. <laughs> right? Now, it's not the comedian's fault. The comedian didn't do a bad job. The comedian was just telling the wrong jokes to the wrong people in the wrong way in the wrong language. And so part of the empathy of marketing is to say, I don't know what you know. I don't want what you want. I don't believe what you believe, and that's okay. But let me try to understand who you are and where you're going before I even tell you what I made, because it might not be for you. And if we're not comfortable saying it's not for you, then we can't possibly be a marketer with empathy. You, nobody right. is marketing something for everyone. So the thing that I hear in that, that I think is one of the most important things for anyone who's trying to start sharing a service is your message is not for everybody. It's not even for half of people. It's not even for 10% of people. It's for a very specific set of people. And you have to learn how to tell that story to them. And the thing that I've learned personally is I always imagine giving advice to the version of me that's 10 years younger. And whatever that archetypical boy was, there's thousands of people out there like that. And the response that I've gotten by what I've done shows that that's true. And so you find your true audience by, I believe, talking to the version of you in your past that needed the wisdom that you have now and really honing not trying to be something for everybody. There's a quote, when you try to talk to everybody, you're heard by no one, you know? And I think that whatever it is that your service is, recognize it's not for everybody. Mm. I think one of the things that this comes, this brings to mind for me is I know some people who have a, <clears throat> have a pretty good Instagram following. Whitney was one of them. So, you know, Whitney had, you know, 100,000 and change some followers and it was stuck there for a long time because she started putting out all of her content about relationships and female sexuality everything that she's been working on through wednesday and her coaching programs and everything like that and putting out way fewer photos of her in bikinis right so her follower count was static every day she gains 150 followers she loses 150 followers gains 150 followers lose not growing at all mm -hmm. and then she would be frustrated like fuck you know, I'm doing all the putting out all this good content, but it's I'm not growing. But I'm like, ah, but you are. Because what you're losing is you're losing people who are not, you know, who are not interested in the insightful comments about relationship, which is your career, which is your path, which is your entrepreneur journey. You're losing the people who aren't interested in that. Right. And and there are interested in something that you don't want to offer anymore. Right. And you're gaining people who are interested in that message that you're putting out. So right. you're refining and honing your audience. And maybe that means your audience shrinks. That's okay. Because it's going to be shrinking down into like a gravity, into a nexus of people who really give a shit about what you're talking about. Right. Even if it went down to 20, mm -hmm. like Seth Godin says, it goes down to 20. But those 20 people are like, man, this dude is fucking putting out, this, or this girl is putting out some amazing content. 
well, you win. Yep. Like you've done it right. You know, so don't try to just please the masses with everything you're doing. Try to find that group that's really going to resonate with what you're saying. 100% agree. And one of the clips that come after this, he really hones in why we have this tendency to only care about the numbers, but we'll let the tape roll. I mean, it's not high school. And high school uh, cursed a lot of us. High school about being popular to everyone. High school about sitting at the table with the cool kids. High school about hiding our insecurities. You know, the, the one lesson that's worth remembering from high school is when you found your people, maybe it was only three of them, when you found that group where you were welcome, everything was better. And that's what we've built now with the internet is that there's more than a billion people but you only need to be trusted by a thousand true fans as kevin kelly would say to make a fine living and for most people it's far fewer than a thousand if you have 10 coaching clients you're fine if you have 20 coaching clients you're too busy i mean it's not that many people yeah that's straight on the money to what we're talking about you know it's just like finding your people yeah. you're not gonna you're not some people are maybe going to be loved by the whole high school and they're going to be fucking prom queen and prom king because they're putting out a general message and we see all these people and if we compare our numbers to the, to these people putting out these general messages i mean fuck i've looked at some of this stuff and i've looked at people who have just millions of followers and been like man i could do that but it's like but it actually to me it's not it's not my truth you know it's like not the content that i would want to put out you know it's content that's different than mine. So, all right, maybe I'm not going to grow as fast as as these other people, and maybe yeah. I won't be ever as big or as you know have the broad numbers. But the people who follow me will really care because they'll vibe with what I'm saying, and and like that's okay. They'll be my people. One hundred percent. You know, and like that's the thing. That's the thing that we have to really remember. A thing that I think about a lot is, <clears throat> uh, beware the audience that you create because they might eat you. And it's this idea that if you're anything other than who you truly are to get your audience, once your audience gets to a certain size, if you ever have the awakening where you're going to start to be who you are, they might fucking eat you. Like I feel for a lot of celebrities who have to be other than what they are to get their audience. Like the definition of an actor or an actress is to play some other role. And so there's millions of people that expect them to be something other than what they actually are. And when they meet these people, they're just in this constant state of getting a reflection back at them that's not them. And that to me has this like tragic Greek quality to it. And for any of us who are gonna use social media to share our message, if you're anything other than who you are, you might get eaten by the fakeness that you put out there. Yeah, because you're you're training people to have expectations of you in a certain way. I think that's why it's so important for like let's say you're a musician and you've been putting out the same kind of material. Like I think it's good if you feel called to put out some new shit. Like Kanye put out a gospel album, he's going to put out if he puts out a fucking country album, he do whatever the fuck he wants. But you know right. what's important about that? Is he's going to have millions of people, maybe tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions of people talking shit. But guess what? Like he's doing what he wants to do. Right. And he's like and he's like taking all of that audience that could eat him and just giving him this fodder and saying, like, yeah, go for it. Chew on this. Chew it all up. Chew yeah. it all up like fucking bubble gum. You know, because I'm gonna do what I want to do. And then yeah, at some point, you know what? I'm gonna circle back and I'm gonna make those fucking club bangers that you like for me so much. But for now, I'm on this gospel country kick. And that's just what I'm gonna do. And it's like to have that metal, you know, that internal metal to allow everybody to chew and just chew and chew and chew and chew and chew and be like, oh, he ain't chewing on me because I'm doing what I want to do and this is on you. And that's genius. Like yeah. when we look back on those type of people's lives, it's genius. Yeah. Like <clears throat> your soul is going to fuck with you if you don't express it authentically. There's a quote from the Gospel of Thomas. Uh that with which is within you, if you do not bring forward, will destroy you. That with which is within you, if you bring forward, will save you. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's this core here is that if you don't bring forth what is within you, your soul is going to have a fucking time with you. Yeah, I think we've all been there, you know, where we've denied 
the expression of that thing that we know that we need to do, you know, and, and then just, it's just a subtle, subtle pressure from whatever that higher force inside ourselves is. And then we release it. And then it's just this, Oh man, thank God. Oof. And then grace comes. Grace. Yeah. Roll the tape. If you're going to make anything happen in the world, whether you're a freelancer, whether you're a writer, whether you just want to lead a social movement, you will make change happen. You might change a non-client into a client. You might change an unfit person into a fit person. You might change someone who is insecure to someone who is secure. But we make change for a living. That's what we do. And change has an ugly little brother, and his name is tension. And it begins with the tension of it might not work, or the tension of I'm going to left, get left behind, or the tension of I'll make a mistake. And when we show up with change on offer, we are inflicting tension on people. Because once we show up in the world, you know, when the Tesla came out a bunch of years ago, it broke every Mercedes in California. Because if you were busy <laughs> driving a $75,000 Mercedes and feeling good about yourself, the existence of the Tesla broke your car. <laughs> yeah, well said. And it creates tension, well said. right? And the tension is, should I get a new car? Well, I just bought this car. What will I tell my husband? And blah, 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 blah. So we invent tension on purpose. And the question we need to ask ourselves, if we're going to be in a community, whether to make a living or just to make a change happens, which, chain, which tension are you trying to make? Who are you trying to cause tension with? And are you comfortable enough in what you are bringing to the world that you are willingly going to inflict tension on people as you do it? Yeah, so the really powerful thing that comes up in me when I hear that clip is to offer any type of change in the world, you create tension not only in yourself by the act of whether or not you think you can do it, but you're creating tension in the people that you care about that you're going to help because you're showing them their life can be other than what it is. And it reminds me of alchemy. You know, like the only way to get to the prima materia is through some type of pressure or some type of cooking or some type of mm. dissolution or some type of fire. And if you're going to offer a service in the world, which I think all of us on some level, level are called to do so, that the fact of that is that you will be in tension and the people you care about will be put in tension by what it is that you're offering. And you have to be willing and heroic to answer that call. Yeah, I mean, it, you can think about it subtly, like maybe let, just, you know, be honest with yourselves here, you know, as you're listening to this, maybe you really don't care that much about recycling. But when you see both of those bins, you know, at an airport or somewhere else, it creates tension. <laughs> and that tension of the guilt of like, well, fuck, I better put this in the right one. You'll pause, you'll take extra time, yeah. you'll make sure that it's in there. And if you fuck it up, You'll think about going and digging back in that trash <laughs> and like rescuing it and putting yeah. it in the other one. What he says there about the Tesla breaking everybody's car who had a Mercedes or any kind of fancy car is like a beautiful example of this tension being created in the marketplace. That's really what disruption is all about, right? Yeah. Like a disruption is something that creates so much tension that it changes the way that the whole industry is. Because you're cruising around in your bends, in your big body bends, you're feeling good. And then all of a sudden you see somebody zip by you in a Tesla and it's faster and it's better for the environment. And you're like, eh, eh, damn. And it's got that big old screen. And it doesn't have any <laughs> knobs or buttons. And you're like, shit. You yeah. know, and it, it, it breaks your car for, not for everybody. Some people are going to like stay true. Like I want, I want my gas powered vehicle forever. I want to run off explosions. You know, <laughs> if I'm not running off explosions, I'm not fucking happy, That's fucking funny. you know, or they might find some reason that the Tesla battery is worse for the environment than burning fossil fuels, whatever. But nonetheless, like, it's just such a beautiful example of, you know, something disruptive in the marketplace, just creating tension. Absolutely. And it goes back to like what open did for a lot of people. Most people didn't even know that open was an option. And the moment they saw that open was an option for a certain amount of people, it broke monogamy. Yep.
open broke me too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't know. I think it breaks. I think everybody gets broken. So moral of the story, we're all going to get broken. Let's just relax and enjoy the process. Just this idea of even offering change creates tension. One of the reasons why I think people got so freaked out when I went into this unconventional relationship and obviously, for those of you who don't know, like I'm no longer in a relationship. I went into a polyamorous relationship with Whitney. It was a grand experiment. It was like being in a wood chipper and also like being in ecstasy. It was all the highs, all the lows, learned a ton. You know, I'm not saying that I'm a, I recommend it <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a way to be, but it's definitely a way to learn about yourself. Yeah. But the mere fact that I was doing it created a lot of fucking tension. Yeah. And it created a lot of tension in people who had a monogamous paradigm because it was like, what the fuck? You're telling me there's another fucking option? And I was like, yep, there's another option. And it's not easy, you know, but there's another option. And there were some people who hated me and still hate me just for the fact that I created the tension of creating an alternate option. Yeah. You know, because they'd been stuffing their own repression and their own lack of passion or whatever the thing was that they wanted from a polyamorous relationship. But they've been stuffing it. And then I was like, well, you could do it. It could work. And you can still be really close. And they're like, it's possible. I'm, it's, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's possible. And just that tension alone caused so much anger yeah. and so much vitriol. And I think that's what any new kind of idea does. It creates this tension like, what? You're telling me this thing is possible? Fuck you. How Fuck dare you? you. How dare you? Yeah. Because that's that that's that tension. You know, that that and I think that's a just one of those examples of how that can play out. But then other people, you know, who are like, it was a relief. It was like a release, like, oh, thank God. You know, like, oh man, I've been really feeling this, but I haven't really, you know, had permission to do this. So, yeah. you know, and like I've really wanted to explore something else. And so on the other side of that tension is people who move through the tension, they get to experience the thing that they get to have. So in the recycling example, go back to it. Someone has a plastic bottle and they're like, God damn, I feel shitty about this plastic bottle. You know, I know these things end up in the oceans. And then they see that recycling bin and they're like, ah, whew, recycling. Like, I feel way better now. You know what I mean? So the tension is necessary to create change and it's going to cause some people to get, you know, feel the tension and be annoyed and some people to feel the tension and be like, ah, whew. You know, it's going to relieve their tension, actually. Yeah, and, and it, it's an insight into how the shadow works, that if there are aspects of being that you've unconsciously find condemnable, so you don't act that way, when you see someone else act that way, if you're unconscious about why you don't act that way, it triggers you. And like a classic example is if you're quiet and timid and you see someone in like a board meeting and they're really loud and they're boisterous and they're not keeping their opinion to themselves... If you inhibit yourself out of fear and you see them not being inhibited by the same fear, you get angry. Like you don't like that person. But if you've made conscious the fact that you find it rude to be that way and you're choosing not to be that way out of love, they don't trigger you. It's truly something that you have chosen not to be. And so I think when it comes to the relationship stuff, people who have condemned their behavior or their urges, and they don't act on it out of fear or out of judgment from God or whatever it is. And they see someone act that way. It's triggering. But then there are people in monogamous relationships who have chosen to be that way out of love who are not triggered by this story. Totally. You know, and there's a quote by Jung and it's something along the lines of that which in the other person irritates you is a sign to the part of you that you're unconscious to. Yeah. Yeah. And there's been, you know, as I mentioned, you know, those two camps, there's that other third camp that you kind of, you kind of talk about, which people are, who are super happy. They're in like long-term relationships and they'll listen to my stories and they'll be like, you crazy, bro. Bro, you fucking crazy. I love hearing these stories though. Yeah. Like it's great. And they'll have a big, they'll have a big warm smile and they're not going to be, they're not going to be bothered by it. And it's just like, yeah, you're probably right. I am a little crazy, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, and it's just like an easy thing. It yeah. does, it's like, it doesn't bother them either way, you know? So if something, I think that's the thing, like pay attention, be the tracker of your own tensions, mm -hmm. be the tracker of where you feel tension and then just like ask why. And that's, that's something that's really interesting. Next clip. Folks talk to me about imposter syndrome all the time and they're very surprised at my response, which is, well, of course you're an imposter. 
That's what it means to do something that might not work. That the heart surgeon who has never done heart surgery on this particular person, who reassures the patient, doesn't know for sure that the patient's going to be fine, doesn't know for sure what she's going to find when she cuts the patient open, that we're faking it. We always fake it when we're doing something for the first time. That is what it means to lead. That is what it means to take the dangerous leap, that you are an imposter. And in fact, if you don't feel like an imposter, either you're a sociopath or you're not trying <laughs> or you're not trying hard enough. And so that feeling can sit right next to your feeling of generous passion, which is I'm not sure that I can prove that of all the people this person could hire, I'm the best one on the planet, but I am super passionate at discovering if I am. That's a big one. That's a big one because I think people want, so people do a couple things. One, they scramble for credentials that they can hide behind. Oh, well, I got this degree and I got this thing. I've been accredited by this organization. So that cures my imposter syndrome. It doesn't really. No. But it's something that they can hide behind. It's something that they can hold up, you know, and if they receive any criticism or they do it wrong, they're like, well, you know, this is what I was trained, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, that the, so it like passes the responsibility onto them. But I think a more courageous choice is to just go forth, recognize like, wow, you know, this is a new situation with a new group of people and I'm going to do my best and it may work, it may not work. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we didn't have a hundred percent success rate with our fit for service mastermind. We had one or two people that were like, fuck this and fuck you guys. You know what I mean? Like with what we were offering and that particular person, it wasn't the right thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's what he's saying about a heart surgeon. Like you could be a good heart surgeon, but there could be some shit that you don't know and you can't see. And that's not going to be work. You could be a great coach, but it may not be the right advice for that person. You know, you may not, you may miss something. You may not see something. You may not be providing the right service. It may not be the right thing. So of course you have to recognize like, I believe in myself, but I may fail. Yeah. And I think that the thing that he talks about there that is such a fucking game changer is the same thing about fear. I think a lot of people who haven't yet began their hero's journey and have, and have begun to start doing scary things over and over again is they think if I get to a place of fearlessness, then I can start to do the thing. But if I feel fear, that means that I'm not ready. But what the heroes from the past will tell you is you always feel the fear and then you act in its presence regardless. And that's courage. And what he's talking about is whenever you provide a service, you will always feel imposter syndrome if you're really at the edge of how big you can be. And it's about acting in the face of that again and again and again. Because people who haven't started want to believe that before they get started, they have to never feel imposter syndrome or they have to never feel fear. And that's not the way this game works. Nope. Nope. It can't work that way, you know, because you're, you're not daring greatly enough. You're not pushing the bound. You're not pushing yourself right. farther, you know, in order, in order to learn, you gotta, you gotta do, you know, you should have some competence. It's not like you shouldn't just go off the street and say, I'm going to learn heart surgery by chopping a bunch of people open and figing it out on the fly, right? The it's consequences murder, yeah. are too high, right? Same with plant medicine, same with offering plant medicine. Right. Don't be an ayahuasca shaman unless you really know and have apprenticed for a long fucking time about how to do that. Don't do heart surgery unless you've gone through and sat in a thousand ER rooms and watched it happen and understand right. it. Like certain things require levels of proficiency. We're not saying to leap so far ahead that you actually are a fucking imposter. Like, are you a heart surgeon? No, but I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express. Like that is not <laughs> sufficient actually to do that, yeah. you know, but, and, but there's so, certain things that, you know, you want to be able to push if it's writing or if it's coaching or if it's these things like you got to push a little bit. And in yeah. all things, you got to push. But I'm just saying have enough proficiency, have the have the respect and the kind of I reverence, that, big. The, re, the reverence for the craft that you actually do dedicate yourself to it before just going willy nilly and having your life be a fucking mess would be like, I'm going to be a fucking life coach. 
well, sort your shit out first yeah. as best you can, you know? That's one of the biggest lessons I've learned from working for you is that before I started working here, I felt that I had to do so much research and so much like preparation to take a step. And it kept me from taking steps. And since I've started to work with you, I see, no, have respect for what you're going to do, do enough, and then go fucking do it and then learn by doing it. Mm -hmm. And that truly has been one of the greatest things that you've taught me. So thank you. You're welcome. And I think a lot of that is just trusting is, it depends. And I, I think there's several things that come to mind when I see that. Like if I'm going to coach an ecstatic dance, you know, it's trusting that I'm going to get the information that I need at the time that I'm going to need it. You know, if it's a podcast, it's going to be a conversation and there's going to be things that you still, I used to get like really kind of like worried. And I do do a lot of research for certain ones. I'll read somebody's book. I'll, I'll go through the process. I'll have the respect for what I'm going to do, but it's that combination of respect and then trust. Yeah. Faith, faith. And then the faith that, that we, we're going to get help in whatever weird way that is. Yeah. You know, that like ideas are going to come to us on the fly, like more, more creative things are going to happen if we just open up you know like I, I launched that new ecstatic dance recently in tulum never done it before never practiced it before was adjusting the playlist 10 minutes before and i was just like fuck it let's let's go and i could feel things that were moving through me as i was doing it and watching people dance that i never would have thought of Right. If I would just thought it sat in my own room and played it over and over again, I would have never thought of that shit. Yep. Same with a comic. Like if a comic doesn't practice his material in a in an actual, you know, open live. mic yeah. or in a with a live audience, they don't know. They're not gonna learn. And yep. so it's like hit your material, riff a little bit, see what works, refine it based on live feedback is gonna be a such so much better learning process than just sitting in this own incubation of master's thought masturbation where you're just like eh, i think this is right that's what i was yeah <laughs> you know and that's just something that you learn from the experience yeah. of doing it the wizard of oz is still my favorite movie and at the end <clears throat> of the at the end where he's handing out the diploma to the scarecrow you know you can print out your own diploma not fraudulently <laughs> but just to tell yourself that you have a permit to tell yourself that you have a license to do this work. And, you know, I started uh, with a couple other people, a business in college that became the largest student run business in the U S and I'm stunned that everyone doesn't do that. You've got your room and board covered one way or the other. Why aren't you running 10 different side gigs? It doesn't have to be a business. It could be, you know, childcare. It could be whatever it says you're interested in. Where is your podcast? How is it that you're 21 years old and there aren't already 100 episodes of your podcast on iTunes? Because more and more, we care about what you've done, not what a piece of paper says you're going to do. Yeah, <clears throat> that's absolutely, absolutely true. Um, what, do you think it, what do you think it is that, that kind of, do you think people just use the idea that they don't have permission. Cause I think that's a brilliant thing that you said. You said, you know, you just print out your own diploma to give you permission, you know, which is this almost like a little ritual that you would do. And in this ritual, you say like, look, I do know something about, you know, something here. And hopefully you're, you're something of an expert in something. You're an expert in something that you've been really passionate about. And so you could, create content or teach or help people with that thing that you've been the most passionate about that they may be curious about learning about. But I think a lot of times people don't have the courage or the, they don't give themselves the permission to actually go ahead and do that. So what would you tell that person, you know, besides, you know, perhaps performing this little ritual, like what would you tell that person about feeling confident enough to share their ideas or to share their services? Well, this is what we started with, which is Salta Mortale, the dangerous leap. And I don't mm -hmm. believe you should do what you are passionate about. I believe you should be passionate about what you do. Because waiting for passion to show up means waiting for fear to go away. And fear is never going to go away. If, on the other hand, you commit today to say, if someone hires me to shovel their walk, I'm going to be the most passionate walk shoveler in history.
because you could fake, you can fake that for 15 minutes in a row. And if you fake it for 15 minutes in a row, you're going to get another gig. And once you got six gigs, you can hire people to shovel snow and then you can stay home and be passionate about staying home. The point is that if the business that you run, Aubrey, disappeared because no one in the world wanted what you do, there's no doubt in my mind you would do something else. That you could probably be a passionate organizer of symphony concerts because you just decided to be passionate. It's not that the world perfectly aligned and here's this perfect thing just ready for you. That has never once happened to me. Never once. But I decided a really long time ago that I liked the feeling of being passionate. So I aim it at whatever I happen to be doing. That's a fucking big one. God damn. That's a fucking big one. All right, so let's take it in order. The first one is the little ritual of creating a diploma yes. for yourself. Like I was just talking about how people scramble for these accreditations from different you know, places that give them excuses and give them basically permission to do something. But when it's from somebody else, it's like, I can hide behind this thing. Let me pay $200,000 for somebody I don't know to give me permission to do what I would already do. Right. And you know, <clears throat> that's one way to do it. <laughs> But the problem is the whole education system is, and I think there even may be a clip on the education gonna, system coming. This. But <clears throat> you know, so I won't go too far into that because. But the whole education system is is fraught with problems because all of the material is old. The world is moving really fast. So you're whatever you're going to be learning from that in all that process with all that money, it's probably not the best info, anyways. So if you're actually learning in the best way possible by listening to the most current podcasts, by reading the best books that are just coming out, that are like the latest research, the latest info, and then you you still need permission, just take the little ritual of writing yourself a little permission diploma. Yep. You know, and like I think it's just a beautiful idea. Like, and print it out and put it next to your desk or wherever you do yeah, your work. Exactly. Yeah, make it as beautiful. Or leave it in your desk. It doesn't yeah. fucking matter. This is for you. This is for you to like a little ritual to give you permission to move forward. Amen. And then the next one, obviously, is this idea about passion, right? Because I think I think so many people like you'll hear a writer like, you know, I'm just the right. And Stephen Pressfield talks about this relentlessly, the writer who's waiting for the muse to hit. And Stephen Pressfield's like, fuck that. I show up every day at 9 a.m. And so the muse knows where to find me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't like sit around waiting for yeah. this magical thing called passion to happen. I just decide I'm going to show up. And, you know, I think the way that Seth talks about it is a little different. He's just like, passion is a choice. Passion is a fucking choice. It's a way of being. It's a way of being. And if you are that, and if you choose to be in, be in that way, you're going to create positive results yep. that are going to allow your entrepreneurial journey to then potentially transition into an entrepreneurial journey or potentially transition into something else even greater. And But you'll be also practicing the art of passion. You know one of my favorite stories my mom tells and talks about all the time is I used to hate doing the dishes. I still hate doing the dishes. <laughs> but one day I was just in a particularly good mood and I decided to create this, this battle with the dishes where the, where the sponge was a sword and the dishes were enemies. It was my own like Don Quixote moment after a big, we had a family of seven, so there's a lot of fucking dishes. Mm -hmm. and it was my turn to do them. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna just go at it. And I'm gonna like, make i'm gonna like make up a tale of how i'm slaying these giants and whatever with this with the sponge and with the soap and with all of this yeah and she just watched me and it was i was in fully engaged and i was happy and i was enjoying the process and i was i was just kind of like a lucky choice but like looking back i could probably do that all the time alchemy i could choose that all the time i still don't if I have to do the dishes, like I still kind of just like eh, grind yeah. through it. But I could probably do the same thing. One hundred percent, you could. And that's it's the power of stories. Like what changed there is you told yourself a different story. And there's, a, I think it's by Nietzsche, and the quote is, "We are all greater artists than we realize." And like we are literally creating our life through our stories. And it's Viktor Frankl's 
quote too, and it's the last of the human freedoms is a man's ability to choose his attitude in any given situation. And that can be literally applied anywhere to generate passion. Mm. Like we have that gift to tell a story about whatever, and we can transform the mundane to the profane through intention and story. Yep. And that's a choice that we have always. So don't wait for passion, be passion. Yeah. And there was an interesting part about fear there too, that might be worth worth bringing up you know because what we're talking about is i obviously wasn't afraid of doing the dishes but like he was saying waiting for passion to show up is waiting for fear to go away right or that people's story about why they need passion is that it will make fear go away and what he's saying is nah fam yeah fear will be with you always right right so don't so don't wait for a moment where you're so sure and so excited that you don't have any hesitancy you know like if you're passionate to speak in front of a crowd or sing you know, don't feel like if you still feel fear, it means you're not really that passionate right. about it. You no. know, like don't use fear as that as that tool yeah. to recognize that. Move forward anyways. Dare greatly. Yeah. There's an Italian expression, salto mortale. And salto mortale means the dangerous leap, the leap into the void. And it's that feeling, mm. that feeling in the pit of our stomach just before we commit to something that might not work. And sometimes we have to you know, resort to a placebo or a meditation or a mantra. It doesn't matter. All that matters is that we leap into the void. And that persistent leaping, you can do that at work or you can do it when you're not at work. But for me, it's the leaping that makes it all interesting. Do you think that's where they get that leap of faith? Because the unknown, it's very difficult to just step slightly into the unknown because of maybe even because of just our emotional tendencies that it, it tends to be just a leap where you have to be willing to risk something maybe your ego maybe your humility maybe you know obviously risking failure uh, do you think that's why they call it a leap well yeah i think that um there are if you have a white wall and you are painting it there's going to become a moment when it's not a white wall anymore when that, mm. that brush touches it for the first time it's a binary event it is or it isn't and mm. lots of things in life happen super gradually. You know, it takes 100 years to become 100 years old. But most of the decisions that we feel like we have to make, those are leaps. Maybe they're small leaps, but they're, they're discreet. Yeah, that's a beautiful way to look at it as that, that binary moment, that moment where you decide I'm doing it. And then there'll be a successive kind of infinite amount of other moments where you have to do some other thing. But in each individual event itself is its own leap. It's its own risk. And a lot of people who are seen by the outside world as being successful are simply successful because they figured out how to hack the leaping thing. Right? If you, if you go to a public swimming pool, you will see that some people take two to six minutes to get in one little step at a time, slowly acclimating themselves. And then somebody else just jumps in the pool. Because if you're going to get wet, just get wet. And all <laughs> that drama didn't actually make it more comfortable for you to get into the pool. It made it less comfortable for you to get into the pool. And I'm not saying that we need to be foolhardy, but I am saying that the way that we choose to leap makes a huge difference in just about everything we touch. Salto mortale. God damn. And that's, uh, I think that idea, what I really, really like about that is the, is the binary moment, zero to one, right? Like blank sheet, brush stroke, yep. zero to one. That's the defining moment, you know, starting, like really fucking starting because you're going from zero to one. You have zero sales to your first sale. Mm -hmm. You have zero parts of your book written to you fucking wrote the first line. You have zero part of your painting done to that first brushstroke on the canvas. <laughs> like that, that moment is huge. And what he's saying is like the skill of the pro, the person who's hacked the system, they just fucking do it. They leap more quickly. They leap more quickly. And that's the thing that I was talking about earlier is before I started to work here, I was the person on the diving board for six minutes. And now that I've worked here, I've learned I'm up there for 20 seconds, you know, and it's about being able to jump more quickly. And there are so many people I know that we know who have done all the work to earn the right to be on the diving board. 
and they are just standing there for months or years just telling all these stories about why they can't make the jump, why they can't make the jump, why they can't make mm. the jump. And I think that the best thing that we can do for the people that we care about is just walk up to that fucking diving board right next to them and just jump in. And it gives them permission. And even better than that, because you know what? Some people might look at you and be like, oh, that person's like a superhero. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, oh, well, that's, that's Aubrey or that's Eric or that's the, that they're, they're not me. But talk about the moments before we had those. Yeah. You know, talk about talk about those times that we struggle with that same thing where it's like we hesitate. Yeah. Like for me, all right, sure, maybe, maybe some I could be at a big speech with a huge audience and someone could pull me and be like, Hey, ah, oh, like my this fucking dude just got food poisoning. Can you go up and, and run a thirty minutes? I'd be like, Yeah, sure. Like I, I would not be a it would not be a moment of hesitation. You know, I could be in there bullshitting with my friends, having already done my piece, and they'd be like, "Ob, oh, we need a forty minute keynote," and I'd be like, well, "Okay, let's go." You know, like that's not a problem. But I could see a group of girls sitting in a picnic, and I could see one of them's really pretty, and she glances over at me, and I could look at her, and I could be like, "Oh God, oh God, <laughs> I really want to talk to her." But I don't know. Oh, God. Yeah. You know, and then uh, I won't leap. I'll come up with some story as to why, like, ah, she's probably with her friends. You know, I'm sure she's just having a good day out there. I don't want to rat. I mean, I don't want to bother her. Like, I don't want to <laughs> inconvenience her with this thing. So better not better for me to just go along my way. Yeah. And, you know, like, I'll find some other way to meet some interesting people. I'll come up with the same shit. Whereas there's another person who, if you ask them to speak in front of a thousand people, they'd be like, ah, I'm going to die. And I and I'm like comfortable with that. You know, but I'm not comfortable going up and walking up to a stranger like that in that situation. Yeah. So like if I'm hopefully by telling this story, it's just to let you know, like, yeah, all right. I got things that I've, I'm used to the, I'm used to the leap. Salto mortale is like my MO, yep. you know, and there's certain things where I still get paralyzed and I still freeze and I still come up with excuses yeah. and I still walk away feeling like a sheepish little coward, Yeah. <laughs> you know, from not having done it. And that's that's okay. Yeah. Before fit for service, um, I had told myself the story that I would never like run workshops or like do things in person in front of a large group of people because I have a stutter and I've had it since I was a kid. And, um, so I, I had weaved this whole story about how I would never do it, how I didn't want to be in front of people, blah, blah, blah. And, um, it wasn't until you made me a coach without asking me, you told me that like, it's what I was called to do. And then I had to go show up for these people. And then I did it. And then I realized, oh my God, this is the most potent container to help people. Like it's so much more, like courses are awesome, they scale. Podcasts are awesome, they scale. But if you sit in front of 30 people and you share what it is that you have to share, I found by doing it that there was nothing more potent than that. But I had sat on that. I didn't even get on the diving board for like eight years. Yeah, man. I mean, I think does it's again like that classic Campbell quote in the cave you fear is the treasure you seek. You know, like there's a very good chance that I'll meet that person that's going to unlock something. Who knows what my future relationship history holds, but there's a very good chance that I'm going to meet that person not through the usual ways that are comfortable to me, but that one salt or mortale leap where I like catch someone and have that feeling like, wow, I think I really vibe with this person. And I go up and I just talk to them. Yeah. I mean, that would, that would, if the universe was, <laughs> yeah. if the universe was actually going to teach me something, it would teach me something through that way. Right. Cause that's the thing. And I don't know where that comes from. Maybe it's this fear of rejection. Maybe it's that I validate myself through, you know, and I've talked about this at ad infinitum on many other different podcasts, but I validate myself through the love of particularly female partners. So even if someone doesn't know me and they reject me, then I take that very personally, you know, and more personally than I would if a audience rejected me or right, somebody else. A thousand else. people. Reject. Yeah. A thousand people. Like if one person looks me right in the eye and is like, ew, yeah. I'm like, oh man, <laughs> oh. You know, it's just, I take that, you know, I take that more yeah. person, whatever the, my own pathology, cause that's what it is. It's my own pathology. Right. It's my own, you know, neuroticism about some certain things, my own delusion about the way that I'm looking at something. 
But if I get over that and talking to Matthew Hussey, which is going to be a podcast that's coming up soon, has really helped me with that. So if anybody is like feeling what I'm feeling and they want advice on how to shift that thought, like definitely pay attention to the podcast I have coming with Matthew Hussey because I can already feel that thing having shifted. I haven't got the opportunity to like play it out in the real world. You will. Because the podcast was recent. But nonetheless, like unbelievable. And he's, you know, one. that's why he's one of the foremost dating experts. Um, but really interesting just to just to recognize that we all have our thing, but on the other side of that leap is that's where the that's where the real adventure and that's where the real magic is. And there feels like there's this <clears throat> spiritual energetic truth that the bigger the resistance you have to the leap you know you're meant to take, that by taking the leap it causes this like ripple in time space that brings you the things that you've been seeking. But it's not like it's in magnitude to the resistance you have to taking the leap. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. All right, roll clip. Learning and education are not the same thing. Education <clears throat> is a top-down coercion-based system of compliance that was built by industrialists to get people to behave long enough to get a job. Learning. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> boom. It's true. Boom. We 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 know <laughs> yeah, we know who that. did it and how they did it. I mean, think about it. You sit in straight rows. If you're defective, they fail you and process you again next year. They test you and measure you. And if you fit and comply, then you get to go to the next thing. Um, But that's not learning. No one becomes a baseball fan because they got educated in baseball. They became a baseball (laughs) fan because they wanted to. There's no baseball textbook to read. You choose to learn something, right? We all learned our native language on our own without a test. And I am big into learning. I'm running Akimbo, which is a series of workshops where we help people learn. But education, education is in real trouble right now because we built an engine around it and that engine is no longer doing what it needs to do. That we cannot win by being more compliant than anyone else because either a computer or someone in a lower paid wage country will be more compliant than us. So any job where I can write down exactly what you do all day, I'm going to get someone cheaper than you to do it. Which means we have no choice but to do jobs where we can't write down what we do all day. And the only way to do those jobs is by learning how and then by caring enough to improvise and to make change as we go. So some people shouldn't go to college. Maybe most people. College is a great place to go. If that piece of paper that you get when you leave opens doors for you that you couldn't get any other way. And uh, if, if it's important to you to have a high school experience, but with more binge drinking and you can afford it, well, then th- that's probably a fine way to spend four years. But think about what happens if instead you spent those four years building things, helping people, connecting people, leading people, just being in it, really in it, not just coasting. Well, at the end of four years, your head start is going to be dramatic. And you can compound it because you can learn a lot without going to school. If it's important for you to have a high school experience with more binge drinking, then college might be right for you. (laughs) Damn, he dropped some fucking some hard lines in the sand there. And I love it because I couldn't I couldn't possibly agree more. That was my that was my college experience. And yeah, I got to do some cool shit. I got to do some stage acting. I got to study philosophy. I got to do a few different interesting things. But it was really a high school experience with way more binge drinking. Like that's really what it was. And yeah. I was in a fortunate position where my parents had the resources to support me to go through this college. And I graduated magna cum laude, blah, blah, blah. I have that paper up on my wall. And it hasn't done anything for me hasn't done a thing. So whatever that little piece of paper that I got didn't do anything for me. It just kind of bought me some time to figure myself out and punish my liver a little bit. (laughs) One of the things that he talks about at the beginning of that clip that is just mind-blowing to me to really connect to, and there's a book on it, I can't remember, but it gets into all this. The education system has not been updated really in about 70 years. And the reason it was implemented was to get people ready to do factory work. 
And if you look at the way it's created, you're put into boxes, you're taught how to respond based off of a clock, you punch in, you punch out, and they're telling you what to know as opposed to teaching you how to learn. And one of the things that he talks about, and it's why I think the rise of the entrepreneur is one of the most important things we can be talking about now is if what you do is a result of education, it means that we can write down exactly what you do. And if we can write down exactly what you do, you will be replaced by either a machine or by cheaper labor from another country. And if you want to thrive in the economy that we're in now, you have to learn how to be in a way that can't be written down. And the only way to do that is to learn how to learn, not to learn how to be educated, which is to be told what to know, and then you become compliant to what you were told. And look, I've, hundred, I've hired hundreds of employees. We have 180 working here at Onnit right now. I don't look at the pieces of paper they've accumulated. I talk to them. I talk about their life experiences. I learn what they've learned. I understand what they're capable of. I figure out if they've cracked the code about how to be great at something, because if they've been great at something, then I believe that they can be great at something else. Yep. There's so many other factors. You know, so once again, like if you're thinking that you need that piece of paper, make your own fucking piece of paper. Save yourself a bunch of money and learn some shit that's actually real and going to be actually helpful. And the only caveat there is if you legally have to go get the paper to do the thing you want to do, like if you want to be an accountant or you want to be a surgeon, we get it. Totally. But for 97% of people, whatever it is that you want to do, you don't legally need to go get that piece of paper. And it's something to really ask yourself, am I paying for somebody else to give me permission? And if so, can I give my, myself permission now? Yeah. Don't write yourself your own surgery <laughs> that's not the way to do it and back to the lifeguard because most people who listen to this most people who engage with you only a couple percentage points of them actually do something actually stand up and follow actually commit actually lead so that's why i bring up the lifeguard story because lifeguards are imposters as well because you're never sure that you can save that person's life and you're never sure that you're the, the best possible lifeguard in history. All you know is you're on this dock right now and there's a drowning person right there. And if you don't want to jump in, don't jump in. But now that person who drowned, that's on you. And what it means <clears throat> is that you have the ability to try, to commit, to contribute. And if you don't take it because you're afraid, well, then you should own it. You should say, I selfishly decided not to put this idea into the world because I couldn't be sure. And so I'm going to hide. And there was a lot of hiding going on in the 1800s or the 1900s, but that's okay because you got paid to go to work and do what you were told. But now we've gotten rid of those good jobs. And if you're going to hide, then commercially and economically, you're going to suffer as well because we've run out of jobs where you can just be compliant, where you can prove you know how to do it. And all that's left are the ones where you're going to feel some level of discomfort because you're doing something that's important. God damn. Yep. I mean, that one hits home. And we touched on this lifeguard thing earlier, but this one really, really, you know, lays the groundwork. Yeah. The thing that comes up for me is, Every single person listening to this now, your combination of genes and experiences have never been brought into the world before and will never come back into the world again. And you have something that you can help people with. You have something that you can serve that will genuinely be medicine. And if you don't do it because you're afraid, own it. Own the fact that you are not helping and that you are not serving because you are afraid. And I think that the greatest form of hell is when you arrive at that last moment of your life and you have to look your potential in the eye and you say, I was afraid. I'm sorry. Let's not, let's not be that, no. you know, collectively. And I think, you know, there's always no matter where you are, no matter how far you are, there's different parts of you that's, that are still hiding, different parts of you that are still playing small, different parts of you that are still avoiding looking at those things that you know you should and then sharing those things that you know you should, ways in which you're not being like the best lifeguard that you could be, that you're still up there on your Game Boy of intoxication or in, 
or a distraction or you know perpetual action or whatever people don't use game boys anymore i guess everything's on a fucking iphone now <laughs> but you know you get the fucking point for people who used to have a game boy all right you know like don't i know it's like referring to a cd player or some <laughs> shit like that right now but um but nonetheless like you know there's a way that you can do it better and and when we had those workshops you know with people who are doing a lot of amazing things in the world like the biggest part of the thing was to just jump in the water and share the thing that could be the most valuable for their for their peers for their community i have nothing else to add man yeah man well look seth is uh you know he's one of the most amazing individuals that you know i've ever uh listened to and also his dedication to put out a daily blog post for like years and years running i mean he's he's actually you know somebody who's walking the walk that he talks and that's that's really beautiful to see and so i'm just you know honored to be able to have that conversation with him and unpack it here with you and that's been great and as we said for those of you interested in the in the guide that we're offering go to aubreymarkets.com slash rise we're going to talk about like a step-by-step approach a pyramid that can help you become an entrepreneur so if that's part of your journey it also applies in certain cases to entrepreneurs as well but we're really focusing this on entrepreneurs what seth calls freelancers you know trillion dollar the trillion dollar industry. industry you know and trying to help people become free to to re- give what they're really here to give through that process so again aubreymarkets.com slash rise check it out we've been working on it and uh, i'm excited to share that with you guys thank you brother thank you brother peace if you enjoyed this video please make sure to subscribe also share with any friend that you think might benefit from it and lastly go to aubreymarkets.com sign up for my newsletter diary and you won't miss a thing